Coming up today, experts say North Korea's test firing of a submarine-launched ballistic missile was successful. As concerns rise, the regime could have fully operational SLBMs by the end of the year. The UN Security Council is holding a closed-door emergency meeting on North Korea's latest missile launch. The missile fell inside Japan's air defense identification zone. Plus, more than 120 people have been confirmed dead following a 6.2 magnitude earthquake in central Italy. Rescuers have pulled dozens of people from the debris. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello to our viewers around the world. It's 6 a.m. on Thursday, August 25th here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. We start with the latest provocation from north of the border. North Korea test fired yet another submarine launched ballistic missile on Wednesday, with analysts saying it was successful. But how threatening is the regime's latest launch? Experts in Seoul say there is serious cause for concern as Pyongyang could have fully operational SLBMs in months rather than years. Connie Kim starts us off. North Korea's submarine-launched ballistic missile fired on Wednesday is being considered a success by North Korea experts in South Korea in terms of technological development. The distance of 500 kilometers covered by the rocket far exceeds Seoul's standard of 300 kilometers for an SLBM launch to be deemed as successful. This is a third SLBM launch this year following the ones in April and July. While there are three levels of development for submarine-launched ballistic missiles until they're considered fully operational, most experts say North Korea has succeeded in its test flight stage. It seems like North Korea has completed its initial undersea ejection stage. That means Pyongyang has entered its test flight stage and will continue to fire submarine-launched ballistic missiles to improve its technology. Military officials say, considering the results of Wednesday's launch, that North Korea could have fully operational SLBM as early as the end of this year. This could pose a great threat to the region as such missiles could cover all of Japan when fully charged. Experts say that the U.S.-made anti-missile system THAAD is effective enough to tackle the North's SLBMs, but even so, South Korea could be caught off guard if they're fired from a lower range of THAAD's shooting altitude. To that, the general consensus is that Seoul must establish an undersea kill chain to respond more effectively to the North's advancing SLBM technology. Concerns are now building up that North Korea will go ahead and work on developing on a nuclear-powered submarine. Connie Kim, Arirang News. The UN Security Council is holding an emergency meeting as we speak to discuss North Korea's SLBM launch. Earlier, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon expressed deep concern about the latest developments and said Pyongyang had ignored international calls for it to change its attitude. He urged North Korea to take measures to ease tension and at the same time return to talks on its denuclearization. The emergency meeting was convened at the request of the United States and Japan and is taking place behind closed doors. Early this month, a similar emergency meeting triggered by North Korea's launch of ballistic missiles failed to produce a tangible countermeasure by the 15 member countries. Now, the South Korean government had been bracing for a provocation like Wednesday's SLBM launch as North Korea had earlier pledged to retaliate against the Seoul Washington military exercises that began early this week. A matter of hours after the launch, President Park and Hay visited an army unit where the joint drill is underway to inspect South Korea's defensive posture. Song Ji Son has more. Hours after the North missile launch, as scheduled, President Park Geun-hye visited a frontline army unit taking part in the South Korea U.S. Uchi Freedom Garden joint exercise. Her first field inspection for these drills outside of command and control. President Bus stressed to troops that Pyongyang's nuclear and missile threats are no longer just a possibility but a reality and a challenge that falls to the military in its role of defending the nation. Pyongyang's nuclear and missile threats are no longer just a possibility but a reality and a challenge that falls to the military in its role of defending the nation. 
김정은의 성격이 예측이 어렵다는 점을 감안하면 이러한 위협이 현실화될 위험성이 매우 크다고 할수 있습니다. 또 고립과 경제 난이 심화되고 고위층까지 연쇄 탈북하는 상황에서 북한 내부의 동요를 막기 위해 다양한 도발을 할 가능성도 높습니다. Having already warned of the possibility of a North Korean provocation before the UFG drills began on Monday, President Park said key to the peace is security and the defense of freedom and democracy. 우리가 튼튼한 안보 태세를 갖추고 국제 사회와 단단하게 힘을 모아야 반세기 넘게 이어온 북한의 도발과 만행의 고리를 끊어낼 수 있고 새로운 시대를 열수 있습니다. Showing her trust in the military and thanking them for their efforts, President Park ordered full military defense readiness to protect the nation and the people of South Korea. Song j i s o n Arirang News. Now, staying with the international response to North Korea's latest missile provocation, meeting in Tokyo on Wednesday, the foreign ministers of South Korea, Japan and China vowed to take a leading role in countering Pyongyang's threats. Our foreign affairs correspondent Gwon Soa reports. North Korea's test of a missile launched from a submarine was conducted on the same day South Korea's Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se and his Japanese and Chinese counterparts Fumio Kishida and Wang Yi met for Foreign Minister's talks in Tokyo on Wednesday, demonstrating a need for strong trilateral cooperation. We confirmed our common understanding that we will not tolerate the North's nuclear program, and we will work to prevent further provocative actions and implement the UN Security Council resolutions against North Korea. As today's meeting, we agreed to lead the international community's response to North Korea and urge North Korea to both refrain from further provocative actions and comply with the UN Security Council resolutions. China agrees with its counterparts regarding North Korea's missile and nuclear program. China will continue to uphold the denuclearization of North Korea. But while South Korea and Japan are currently moving to keep up the pressure on the North, China will continue to uphold the use of dialogue and consultations to resolve the issue. And that's not the only difference. Seoul and Beijing are at loggerheads over the deployment of a U.S. missile defense system to the Korean Peninsula. And prior to the trilateral meeting on Wednesday, Minister Wang once again expressed China's opposition to the THAAD system at a one-on-one -on -one with Minister Yoon. According to Seoul's foreign ministry, the two agreed to keep in touch on the issue, with Minister Yoon saying that a single issue should not be the thing that hampers their bilateral relationship. Talks on extending that relationship could take place later in the year, as the three ministers agreed to work toward organizing a summit for their heads of state following a similar meeting in Seoul last year. k w o n s o a Arirang News. More than 120 people have now been confirmed dead and at least 360 injured after the 6.2 magnitude earthquake that struck central Italy on Wednesday. Officials say rescue teams are searching for survivors in remote and mountainous areas reduced to rubble. Most of the dead were in Amarici, where three quarters of the town is believed to have been destroyed and nearby Akumali. Pope Francis has said he was deeply saddened for the victims and he thanked the people who rushed to the area to help. UN Secretary General Ban Ki moon has also expressed his condolences to the people of Italy. And a powerful 6.8 magnitude earthquake struck Myanmar on Wednesday, leaving at least three dead and damaging some of the country's centuries old temples. The quake was so powerful that it was also felt in Thailand. Bangladesh and India. The U.S. Geological Survey says the quake struck 25 kilometers west of Chaok at a depth of 84 kilometers. The affected area is located on an active earthquake zone and regularly experiences tremors, but rarely of this magnitude. The last major quake to hit Myanmar was in 2012. Staying with international news and suspected militants have stormed 
the Kabul campus of the American University of Afghanistan. Sources say one person has been confirmed dead and 14 have suffered injuries, but the exact number of casualties remains sketchy as the attack may still be underway. Witnesses say some students jumped from second floor windows to escape the gunfire and explosions, breaking their legs. And foreign staff and dozens of pupils were trapped in the compound. A senior government official says elite Afghan forces have surrounded the university. Two gunmen are said to be hiding inside the building and a clearing operation is currently said to be underway. No one has yet claimed responsibility for the attack. Now, the number of babies born in Korea went up in 2015 compared to the year before, and this is extremely welcome news for a country with one of the lowest birth rates in the entire world. And most notably, the number of women giving birth in their 30s rose sharply. Ian Shin has the details. Korea saw the highest birth rate among those in their late 30s in 2015, according to the latest data. Statistics Korea says on Wednesday, the birth rate among women in the age range between 35 and 39 stood at 48.3 in 2015, a record high as well as a nearly 12 percent increase compared to the year before. Along with that, the birth rate for the age group of 30 to 34 also saw an increase of 2.5 percent between 2014 and 2015. And the average age of Korean women giving birth for the first time stands now at 32.2 also a jump of 0.2 than the previous year. Nowadays, Korean women are deciding to wait until later in life to get married due to a number of reasons, but the biggest one, in my opinion, is the desire to invest more time and energy on themselves first, which explains why women in their 30s have a higher birth rate than women in their 20s. The nation's total projected number of children born per one woman, known as total fertility rate, was 1.24 in 2015, an increase from the previous year's rate of 1.21. The recent hikes in birth and fertility rates, in other words, represent nearly 3,000 newborns between 2014 and 2015. However, these figures are still significantly lower compared to the OECD average of 1.68. Moreover, of all 34 OECD nations, the only country that has a lower fertility rate than Korea is Portugal, with a rate of 1.23. Although there have been gradual increases in birth and fertility rates, experts say that it may still take a while for Korea to see a significant boost in population growth. Yunshin, Arirang News. Now, South Korea and China mark 24 years of diplomatic relations this week. Since 1992, the two countries have seen enormous progress in a great many fields. Uh, for a look back at nearly a quarter of a century of bilateral ties, Kim Hesung reports. 19-year-old Guo Yi is one of some 90,000 Chinese nationals who have come to Korea to study. I became interested in Korea's pop dance after watching Korean TV shows. So I decided to come and study here for at least five years, which I believe will give me more opportunities in the field of K-pop dancing. Strengthening economic ties between Korea and China has led to an increase in people-to-people -people ties, with more people enjoying the other country's culture and studying their respective languages. The number of Chinese studying in Korea has soared from just three in 1992 to 94,000 as of last year. Of course, the number of Chinese tourists visiting Korea continues to rise, many drawn by the so-called Korean wave or Hallyu, but also by Korean cosmetics and food. Last year, more than 10 million tourists from the two countries visited each other. Since the normalization of diplomatic relations in 1992, Korea and China have brought about a diplomatic renaissance unprecedented in speed or scope. Trade the main driving force. Bilateral trade has increased almost 40-fold from 6.3 billion U.S. dollars in 1992 to 227 billion in 2015. Since 2010, the two sides have been seeing their economic relationship mature even further, extending to areas like finance and services with growing foreign direct investment, currency swaps and direct trading in Korean won and China's renminbi. In the span of 24 years, Korea and China have become closer in various ways. But as with any diplomatic partnership, not everything is rosy. 
As North Korea wretches up tensions in the region, Seoul and Beijing face some challenges such as narrowing their differences on how to resolve geopolitical security issues. The two have recently differed over South Korea's deployment of the U.S. THAAD missile defense system. North Korea remains a shadow over the two countries' strengthened ties. As the geopolitical security environment in Northeast Asia gets even more complicated, the two countries will have to use their soft power to address the challenges. The key will be how the two countries use their economic ties and public diplomacy to find a mutually beneficial solution. Kim hye Arirang News. Well, that's all we have for now on this Thursday morning here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. We'll be back throughout the day with more newscasts. Our next bulletin coming up at 10 a.m. Korea time. So until then, goodbye.